Spring class. Welcome to this week's Nora Startup webinar. And the topic of today is on successful industry academia collaboration to industrial PhDs. Uh, my name is Morten Goodwin, and I'll be trying to coordinate today's session, which is both a webcast and also a podcast. So you might watching us be watching us live right now. You might uh, down, have downloaded a video, which you watch after it has happened, and you might listen to this as a podcast. For those of you who listen live, uh, the key to these webinars is interaction with the audience. So please, if you have questions to me or to any of the panelists, please make sure that you write this in the chat and we'll make sure that we answer your collaboration questions. Because in this week's uh, webinar, we will focus on industrial PhDs. That is companies that seek to enhance the research expertise and activities who apply to, for uh, industrial PhD funding. So an industrial PhD project culminates in concrete research and development that results and enhance the company's core activities. So today we will talk with four industrial doctoral candidates at different stages in the research cycle. We learn about the application process, what motivates the companies and what hurdles we should avoid. So we will first talk with uh, Elisabeth Astrid from Sparebank in Sør who collaborates with uh, us at the University of Agder. Uh, we will then talk with Pia Snedsru from Oger Medical, a spin-off of similar research uh, laboratory. And then we will talk with Nan Van Nguyen, who finished his PhD with eSmart Systems in 2019. So he's already finished and has a lot of uh, knowledge about what to do and how to actually finish. That's very important. Uh, but in collaboration with the University of Tromsø, Arctic University. And then last but not least, we will talk with Sven Opalik from Login Eindom, collaborating with Rema Tusen, who is also in collaboration with the University of Agde. So what we'll do today is we'll have a session with these four presenters. They'll have some minutes to present, and then we'll try to have a meaningful debate later on. So audience, please remember any questions, put them in the chat, and we will start then by uh, letting Elisabeth from uh, uh, the southern part of Norway uh, start it. So Elisabeth, what can you tell us? Yes, hello. My name is uh, Elisabeth. Uh, I'm an industrial PhD at the University of Eider. Um, and uh, I'm now uh, also um, Head of Digital Channels uh, and Market in Sparbank and Sør. Uh, last year, I started a process, a quite rough one, I must say. Um, uh, but before I tell you about that, I'll tell you about my background. I um, um, have a master, Hovudfag, it's called. Uh, I'm that old, uh, 20 years ago, in comparative literature and philosophy. And after that, when I finished, I started as a trainee in Yensidia, financial uh, insurance company, and stayed there for seven years. And I also had two years in Cololine as head of uh, internet. And now for the last eight years, I've been in Sparebank in Sør as head of digital channels and marketing. So I've uh, been working a lot and uh, had a lot of issues regarding data, customer data, how to use data in the right way. Uh, a lot of ethical issues regarding that as a bank. Um, and I started to see that we needed uh, some more information and uh, research uh, about how to use the data in a good way. Um, and I had a friend, a friend of mine, she had uh, just uh, delivered her project, her industrial um, PhD project, and she tipped me uh, and said that try to, to manage to, to get up a, a project so, um, so you can start to do some research within that field. 
And um, my process around that was to get my organization, Spiderbuck Concert, to see the value of that kind of research. I also needed uh, the NFR and uh, Forskningsrådet to, uh, to help me, of course. Um, and uh, because the NFR um, is the one who has to, to um, support financially, of course, the, the, the PhD project. And also I contacted the, the University of Agder because um, it's been 20 years since I was at the university. So I needed some coaching um, to, to find out what kind of, what is a good enough research project. Um, yes, so I tried to write a thesis proposal aiming to show the value for the company, for Sparbank Insert, uh, a proposal that also fit the NFR uh, framework. And I also, in the proposal, um, had to show how the project filled a gap in the field of the research area. And I also had to try to fill that, uh, to find that um, killing research question. Um, and I have a tip for you guys, uh, my golden key, uh, uh, how, I, how I made it, the way for, for my success so far. Uh, and the success is uh, shortly just to, to get a contact person in each of the three domains. Find yourself a, a person in the organization or several who, who really uh, believes in your project and also see, sees the value, of course, of the project who is in charge and, and can take some decisions and help you to get it through in the organization. Find a person in the NFR who can help you and guide you through the, the process for um, applying. And also at the university, find a person or two. I had two, I had Morten and also another one who is now my supervisor, Aina Duengen Bern, um, to help you to design your project uh, in, a, in a good way. So I started in January, I'll finish now. I started in January. I, I've done this now for a year. I have two more years to go. And um, at the moment, everything's chaotic. So I think everything is just the way it should be. And I also have to say, I have to mention, um, my project is uh, historical because I'm, I'm the very first industrial PhD at the Faculty of the Humanities and Education at the University of Agder. Shall, uh, shall I say something about my project, uh, Martin, or is it enough? No, please. Uh, two minutes about your project will be very nice. Okay. Um, my pre preliminary research question is uh, how will use of AI in the customer interface affect Spiderbank in search ability to act as an ethical, socially res responsible relational operator? So it is about bank. How can the bank, Spiderbank in search, use artificial intelligence in an ethical way? In a, yeah. Shortly. That's a very exciting project and especially exciting that it is a project uh, not in uh, uh, technology. Well, it's in technology, but it's not in computer science. It's not in those type of uh, uh, traditional industrial PhD candidates. As I said, the first in humanities, maybe the first in philosophy. <laughs> so what made you convince the company that uh, you should get a philosophy doctorate? Well, um, luckily enough, uh, my company is uh, occupied with ethical stuff um, and uh, it's important for Svarbark and Sir to, to do things in an ethical way. Um, yeah, so it was actually quite easy. Um, but I think that the, the main thing was that the NFR, of course, subsidized uh, the project. Um, it was much easier for, for Spiderbank to, to say yes to this when they got money from NFR. Of course. Right. Because just to be clear, so NFR funds uh, half of the PhD project and then you have to, the company typically has, has to fund the other half. So you get half price uh, PhD kind of way uh, from the NFR. So that's a uh, 
it's a very lucrative uh, project, I would say. So, and the research council is throwing money at us to get this as long as we have a university um, that can support. Yeah. Uh, and what was it, how was it after um, you said many years, 20, the outside of academia, and then you went back? So what was that process like? Well, it's quite tough, I must admit, um, because uh, every organization and every um, work way have their own way of speaking and thinking. And uh, I must say my, my way of thinking was quite destroyed uh, from after 20 years away from academia. So I have spent a lot of time trying to get into the way of thinking and speaking and articulate. Um, but I must say, I really enjoy it. It's it's really great. <laughs> so that's good to hear. So Elizabeth enjoys her time in academia, and then we will hear if that is also true for Pia Smedsru, who uh, works with Oger Medical. So thank you, Elizabeth. We will come back to you in the discussion later. But uh, Pia, could you tell us a bit about what you're doing in your process? Yes. So uh, my name is Pia Smetsru. So a little bit about my background first. I am a medical doctor uh, and I was finished with my medical studies uh, in January 2016. And I worked in the hospital as usual for a couple of years. Uh, and I think it was partly the fact that uh, hospitals in Norway aren't really in the, at the forefront of using technology. Uh, especially it was quite frustrating working with slow computer systems and uh, calling each other's um, old school uh, calling systems. So instead of getting a phone, you have a pager and we still use that in hospitals. And um, when I worked at Ullevål uh, only, I think, yeah, two and a half years ago, we were still faxing each other stuff because that was the most efficient technology we had for communicating with uh, other departments. So I think that's at least in part uh, responsible for my change <laughs> of career. Um, so I was pretty lucky and I got in touch with uh, the research group uh, at Simula, which is now called HOST, holistic systems, and they are working among other things with machine learning in medicine. And I, uh, I got lucky and they hired me as a research trainee. So I got a six month uh, um, position there where I got to uh, learn a lot about uh, machine learning and programming and a lot of stuff that I didn't know before. I have always had an interest for technology, but I didn't have any formal, um, I haven't been studying technology in that sense, in computer science. And then um, Simla is, um, they have, uh, they're a research, um, how do you say, research institution. Um, and they have also an, a department called um, Simla Innovation. And it's important for Simla that the, their own researchers are able to take their technology to the market. Um, so what happened around the same time uh, was that this technology that the, this research group was uh, researching, they were able to make a startup, which is now a gear. And I uh, wanted to pursue a PhD in this, which kind of matched up with the fact that this company was started. So it was very fitting to do an a, um, industrial PhD, which is, I was actually the first uh, employee of the company. <laughs> um, because uh, as long as we could get my project approved by uh, UIO, which is the, the grade giving institution. And I have um, supervisors both in the company at Simula and at UIO. Then, uh, and as long as the company also could provide half of the money, then uh, the NFR um, pays the rest, so to say, which is very good. So, um, and in addition, we also actually applied for, you can also apply for something, some kind of lab money also in addition to the, the um, industrial PhD. 
So this has been important for me to be able to do this PhD. Um, so the project we are working on is um, constructing a machine le learning based approach for detecting polyps in colonoscopy. So colonoscopy is the not so sexy examination of um, uh, um, checking out your large bowel with a camera, uh, <laughs> looking for polyps that may or may not turn into cancer. And it's the gold standard examination for detecting uh, colorectal cancer. And um, yeah, the nature of the examination is that it's only assessed by the doctor then and there in real time, and they never store the whole videos, which also means that there's um, a, a relatively large degree of missed polyps in these examinations, which means that there's an uh, there's a potential for artificial intelligence to detect more polyp polyps and let's uh, save people from cancer, which is what we work on. And my, um, so my PhD is in computer science and uh, it's at the Institute for Informatics at UIO. But uh, as I don't have a computer science background, um, my position in this is mainly to try to be the interpreter between the clinicians and the computer science guys because it turns out that it's hard to communicate across um so this different disciplinaries disciplines yeah so that's what i'm trying to do thank you pia you said that you were the first employee so how large is uh, uh we have uh six employees Six employees. So that's very different from Elizabeth. I'm not sure how many it is in Sparbank and but I'm guessing that's more than six. At least I've seen more than six people there. Yeah. So that's interesting because it's uh, uh, it's more of a startup. It's uh, very maybe. much a startup. Yeah. And so, what was that process like? Uh, so, well, for me, it's also very different than working in a hospital environment. Uh, not only six employees at Ulvol Hospital either. Um, I am also the chief medical officer of the company. So I am uh, at the four, four year PhD. So I work 25% for the company. Um, it's also, uh, I think it works very fine for me since my PhD project is has the same goals as the company. Uh, we are, have been conducting a lot of uh, data collection, which is important for my PhD and the annotation of the data, which is also the same, and all the research we are performing in the company is also part of my PhD. So it, uh, this fits nicely, I think. I'm not the one doing most of the programming. I have, uh, we have more skilled people than me at that. But I think um, we also have other medical doctors in the company, and I think it's been important to have someone who can kind of talk both languages and it's been important for the for the collaboration, I think. You, you said you were doing your PhD uh, over four years. How far into the PhD process are you? I started a little more than one and a half year ago. Yeah. So I have a little more than two years left. Yeah. So yeah. halfway, if you can put it like that. Yeah. So do you feel halfway or do you feel? Uh... Um, <laughs> well, uh, kind of, actually. Okay, that's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> But as Elizabeth said, it's still quite chaotic. And sometimes you feel like everything is going everywhere, but then every now and then you kind of get up to the surface and get some air and get some overlook and you realize that you're actually going somewhere. <laughs> so that's good. That sounds great. It's yeah. chaotic and somehow it needs to be uh, put down and thesis handed in. And one who has been able to do that apparently is uh, Nan Nguyen. So you have finished your PhD already. So we'll then thank uh, Pia Smedsru and we'll include you later in the debate. But uh, Nan, so you're, uh, uh, you're in the luxury here than all the rest because you <laughs> finished with all this chaotic process. So please tell us what was the process like and how did you do it so successfully? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Nhung Nguyen. I'm originally from Vietnam. I came to Norway about six years ago uh, to do a master in applied computer science at uh, Oxford University College in Holland. 
And then I continue with uh, an industrial PhD with ESPA system and the UIT machine learning group at the University of Tromsø. Um, the topic of my PhD is uh, advanced in deep learning for automatic uh, autonomous vision by power inspection. I can try to summarize the project briefly. Um, as you know, in Norway, uh, power lines are inspected and maintained regularly to prevent blackout and uh, power failures. But the traditional methods for inspection, including, for example, uh, uh, low flying helicopters and foot patrol, for example, inspectors have to walk along the power line and climb up the pole to do close up inspection. It's quite dangerous to do that. And sometimes they fly helicopters and take pictures and then manually go through each picture to uh, identify defects. And that's a very costly process. So uh, the PhD projects, uh, we aim at um, autom automating that process by applying deep learning. So basically we build a uh, drone and then we fly them along the power line, take pictures, and then we build deep learning model to analyze the pictures automatically to identify potential defects. And the goal is to save costs and uh, increase the safety of inspection. And I defended my thesis December last year, so luckily it was successful. I'm now working at the senior data scientist at ESMA system. So I continue working for ESMA after the PhD. Uh, I work mostly with uh, AI and deep learning now, and I still continue with the project, which is about the automatic power inspection. Um, I would like to share a bit about my experience uh, in, in the last three years. Uh, um, in the last three years uh, as industrial PhD was great experience for me, uh, personally and professionally as well. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with both um, one of the best machine learning group in Norway, we see the UAT machine learning group, and eSmart System, we see a leading AI company in automatic power line inspection. And I also got to work with very good mix of uh, academic researchers at the uh, machine learning group and also uh, industrial scientists at ESMA system as well. They have very different perspectives when it comes to research. So it's good to learn from, from, from different uh, researchers and scientists. Yeah. And, and how large is uh, eSmart uh, Systems? How many? Uh, it's about 70 employees now. 70? Yeah, yes, yeah, oh. so I have many uh, offices actually in Halden, Oslo, and the US, and a different place in Europe as well. Good. And so they were able to recruit you uh, and to keep uh, you were uh, after your PhD, you, uh, they, it was so attractive that you kept doing the same. Type of work. Yeah, um, luckily the, the PC projects, uh, they like that. And now it's becoming one of the biggest uh, projects at ESMA system as well. And we're building the project and making it bigger. We actually got the, another industrial PhD student to continue with that project. And then I'm supervising him now. So hopefully we will have a, another successful candidate in three or four years. And is your daily life in the company different, very different from before you finished your PhD a year ago to now? Oh yes, very different. Uh, oh. The the most important thing in us, I can sleep better now. <laughs> you sleep better. <laughs> and you know, it's um, it's a very different experience as an uh, industrial PhD. Uh, and my my industrial PhD was only three years. It was one hundred percent. It was a bit intense. Uh, after that, I get to work and uh, continue with what I like to do. So it's much better now. So Elizabeth, was it three years? Pia, is it four? And you did it uh, three years. And uh, Sven, I think you are doing it uh, four years. And the question, of course, is if you sleep as well as none do. So thank you. Now. <laughs> we will include you in the debate in a few minutes. But yeah. Sven, do you sleep yeah. as well as none? Or is I struggling? Uh, I sleep horribly. But uh, luckily, not due to the PhD, uh, due to my daughter <laughs> keeping me up at night. Uh, no, the PhD is progressing. Um, I'm now on a little bit over halfway in a four year run. Uh, my thesis is on uh, deep neural networks for uh, 
smart warehouse uh, intelligent control of, of let's say complex energy systems uh, and uh, I'm also the chief technical officer in uh, my property development company. Uh, in fact, we've done some work together with eSmart Systems, and they, we have uh, uh, some platforms that we use. So uh, maybe we'll come across each other now. Um, yeah, so I'm, I've been working for quite a while. It's progressing well. I've done the publications that I, I wanted. Um, it's a difficult field. Uh, I have an engineering background uh, from a very practical perspective. So the transition to programming and academia was, uh, you know, it was very different. I think it's gone nicely, but the chaotic phase uh, I can well attest to. It's, it's landed a bit more now, perhaps, but uh, in the beginning, a lot of time was spent just uh, picking up the programming language, picking up a lot of uh, computer science theory that I wasn't familiar with. Um, but uh, it's been uh, incredib incredibly useful. And uh, we, all, we also have some very nice results um, trying to uh, control, uh, for example, trying to control a battery system connected to a photovoltaic solar power plant. Um, we have, uh, as a company, we're trying to kind to push uh, push the border on on building and uh, area development uh, towards a more sustainable uh, future. And um, as the complexity increases, we see more and more need for intelligent systems to to control all the various components. Uh, I got started uh, and went into this thinking somebody else would do the PhD. We uh, got in touch with Morten at UIA uh, about uh, two years ago, maybe a little more, asking him what he thought about uh, uh, the direction our project was taking, what the possibilities were. And uh, he advised us that a PhD was perhaps the most suitable way forward. Uh, and uh, it was then that uh, people in Rematusen suggested that maybe I should do it since I knew the buildings and I knew the systems and I'd been part of developing them. So um, after some time, I, I agreed and I'm very happy that I did. It's been extremely uh, educational and uh, useful and I've got to know a lot of very skilled people. Um, this year I was supposed to be, uh, which kind of leads me to uh, something very good about Anafar. A lot of things have been mentioned already, but they also have this uh, foreign exchange program. So this year I was supposed to be in Melbourne in Australia. I was supposed to leave in April, me and my whole family. And uh, we were supposed to be there until uh, Christmas or New Year's. So it's been, uh, it's been a journey, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get to go next year. Uh, the, the um, what do you call it? Not the offering, but Tilburda, the, um, of the foreign exchange program that they offer is very nice. The, you get very uh, good terms and you get your, you can bring your family and um, yeah. I would encourage everybody to, to at least uh, explore that possibility. And and the reason you didn't go to Australia might be obvious to most, but for those yeah. listening three years from now, it was because yeah. of the right? Yeah. Yes, it's due to the the virus that okay. we're kind of plagued by right now. Okay. Yeah. And and how how large is your uh, company, Sven? <laughs> yeah, so the, um, the actual company I'm in now, we're only five or six people. We're going to be six people now but we're uh, part owned by Reitan, which is the people who own Rematusen. And uh, so we're part of a pretty large system, but we operate, I would say very closely to a, a small company, very dynamic with uh, uh, very, uh, 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 very good communication and uh, dynamic uh, 
a dynamic organization where we're, we're allowed to do almost everything and we, we change pace and change direction as, as we see fit. So that means that we have examples from relatively large companies and also small companies uh, here. And we heard also that Pia and Nan did their, uh, went into the PhD program, not that far from their masters. What about you, Sven? Yeah, so I, I spent uh, almost 10 years working uh, as an engineer uh, within renewable energy and uh, energy systems from the practical side, not the software side. So uh, yeah, it's been a while since I was in academia as well. And you're also doing it four years, right? Yeah, four years. So that means that you and Pia are doing 25% of company things and then 75% of the uh, of PhD things is the idea. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things I would like to discuss today is, is exactly that. So how do you, in a small company or a large company, uh, say no to customer interaction if that takes time for your PhD? How do you prioritize PhD work versus company work? Do you spend four days doing PhD and Friday company work or how is that? So we, we, since we have you talking now, Sven, we can start with you. So how do you prioritize the PhD work and versus the company work? Yeah, I mean, I guess you just do twice the amount of work. <laughs> <laughs> to be very honest, at least at times it feels like that, but... Um, uh, we, we talk about it and like this fall, we know there's a lot of stuff happening in the company. So I've been doing less PhD work, whereas this spring I had more time to do PhD. The plan was also when I go to Australia to focus almost exclusively on the PhD and to just be kind of, I could touch bases back home, but other people would be more day to day. Uh, so hopefully if I go next year, then I'll be able to focus on it almost 100%. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge. You have to uh, put down some ground rules and uh, say no. And yeah, it's difficult. So what about you, Pia? Do you, you also do four years, meaning 75% yeah. PhD, 25% company work? How do you manage to do that? Well, I have to agree with Sven. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's hard to keep those hours uh, at a minimum. But um, I actually started uh, as a full-time PhD student, which was a very bad idea. So if there's any chance of you doing anything other than a PhD in the company, then I would advise to just start it, uh, for example, at a four year from the beginning, because you're going to do that work anyway, you might as well kind of get paid for that and a company might as well kind of get paid for that. Because that was no problem with the NFR to just, um, Kind of spread the money out over four years instead even halfway uh, or after almost a year i think we changed that seeing how it didn't really work out um but it's uh, yeah you have to kind of you have uh, i have like supervisors who are mainly academic and i have supervisors in the company and of course all everyone is uh is keen on me getting the PhD done, but it's uh, you're kind of dragged in different directions. So at the end, it's me, it's I who have to say no uh, to something and kind of sometimes say, do I really need to join this meeting? Does, do I have to be in this meeting or could I maybe do something else for now? Because uh, no one else is going to say that, I think. And then, uh, so it's not like once a week I do company work. It's uh, some phases are more company and some phases are more academic, I think. Right. And I also uh, try to uh, find, because um, you have to take these um, is like credits or, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, credits. So I tried to find courses that were both matching uh, my topic, but also could be kind of combined more easily with work, yeah. So it's nice to hear that uh, NFR is flexible, that you, if you apply for three years, you can change it to four. I, yeah. I guess the, the amount NFR pays out, the research council is the same anyway, so why shouldn't they be, but. Yeah, that's the same, but I think it's uh, it makes more sense 
at least for me uh, and for the company also because it, it's going to take for years so the company kind of also gets their um expenses kind of over four years right yeah so but you said that it was a bad idea to do a PhD three years because you have to do the company work anyway. And Elisabeth, you do a PhD three years. So is it a yeah. bad idea for you? Sorry? So Pia said that it was a bad idea to do a PhD three years. And do you think so? Well, uh, I hope not for me. Um, based on my experience as a manager for 10, 15 years, I, I knew that if I worked a few percentage it would never be 10% or 15, it would be the double at least. Uh, so I um, I asked if I could do this 100% uh, because I knew I needed to devote myself 100% uh, into the project. Uh, so for me, it's been a good solution, but I, I think that's up to you and what kind of situation you are in, what kind of company you are in. Uh, I think for me, in, in, in a big company like Svalbank and Sjöld, it's easier. But if you're in a small company and you're a critical resource, and a res uh, resource then it's di more difficult, of course, to, to go out and not uh, deliver work um, yeah, and just do research. And another advantage is that I'm, I'll be back faster. Uh, yeah, 100% after. Only three years, not four, yeah. But the, that means that there's nobody calling you on a Tuesday evening saying that we have this very important meeting with a customer, you need to join. No, not that, that kind of uh, calls, not anymore. In the beginning it was a little bit, but then, uh, but now I, it's been a while since I got the calls, yeah. Every now and then, but not that much. Good, so it seems to be a bit unclear. Uh, your process, Pia. So could you please explain again how you went from a three-year PhD into a four-year PhD? Yeah, so it was an industrial PhD from the beginning. Um, uh, so, but what happened was that we kind of saw that I was spending more and more time on company stuff, which was when we decided that it should probably uh, be a four-year PhD instead, because uh, company uh stuff took up more and more of my time and that meant i had less and less time for the academic and the phd work so that was how uh, we decided to switch and then we had to apply nfr uh, to kind of uh, spread the money out over more the remains of the money over the more years or four years in total so that's how we switched kind of and then i had to apply to a uio also for an extension of the uh, studio yeah. yeah, right to study somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's several applications, typically one for the university, the, you are a right to be a PhD student, and one for the research council to get funding. And there's, a, of course, the third part is the company. So there's yeah. a lot of companies all around uh, that have their own interests. Maybe there's even conflicts of interests sometimes. So, Nan, did you, did you experience any type of conflict between uh, the company and Simula or University of Tromsø? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, as my PhD was like a three years, so it's, uh, I didn't have like twenty percent to work. But uh, of course, we cannot say no to uh, uh, customer meetings and stuff like that. But what we can do is, uh, from my personal experience, is that we can choose the one that benefits the PhD to focus on that. In my case, um, uh, the goal was to uh, build something that can reduce the cost for utilities. So I chose to attend meeting with utility to understand their process and things like that. And those meetings actually helped me a lot. So that's one thing. And another thing I, I have to agree with uh, Sven, that sometimes we have to do both, but just need some ground rules. So that the uh, company, they understand that uh, some tasks are for PhD, but yeah, some we can do, but not that as like a full-time employee. So. And as a uh, technical computer science PhD, do you uh, you can see as a some people will say that there's a conflict between publishing result and maybe doing a patent or keeping something secret. Did you experience any? Conflict like that? No? Uh, yes, of course. But we just need to. Um, separate the uh, 
thing that the company owns and the thing that we can publish. In my case, the data, the company owns the data. I cannot publish the data, but the mentors that uh, train on the data and if we make something general that can be applied in all the field, then it's a solid research uh, publication already. And it doesn't contain any uh, like secret uh, material that the comp company don't want to, to, to publish. And that's okay in a way. So, so it means that I read your publications, I will not get the company data, but I'll get the general method. And but mm. still the company uses that method with some data. Yes, yes, yeah. In, and is this similar to how you do it, uh, Sven, in your company? The company keeps the data and uh, uh, me at the university is able to... Yeah, it. yeah, I would say it's very similar. And I remember the we had a lot of these discussions going into it, but it's been much less of an issue than, than we thought it would be. And I also, what, what really astonished me about the computer science and AI community is that so much of the resources are publicly available anyway. So many of the programming libraries, everything is kind of knowledge is really shared. So our my PhD at least is 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 application based. So we're taking a lot of the knowledge that's already out there. Of course, we're adding some some components, but uh, I don't see it as a big issue really. Not not in this area. Uh, I think uh, keeping the data and sharing the method is a very good approach. Yeah. And. Do you, can you relate at all to this, Elizabeth? Is the company want to have some of your philosophical methods uh, secret or? Well, actually, I think that the difference is um, it's um, my reasoning that is the the research sort of. So it's it's not the same. It's not comparable in, in that way. But mm. do you have, can you see any? Have you experienced any any other hurdles that you may envision or tell us or? other people who want to apply for an industrial PhD that could stand in the way, other than Corona. You know, Corona is a big hurdle, but... Uh, yeah, uh, any burden? I'm uh, sorry. Any, any, anything that potentially could stand in your way that you were able to push away. So maybe it could be... Uh, as you talked about getting back to academia, but uh, what about the writing process? Is, is it uh, something that you found difficult? Yes, of course, uh, doing a PhD is really hard work. So that might be a burden in itself. Um, but for me, I, I don't see any burden. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge um, uh, give in right. for, for, for all parties. Uh, just for me, uh, for me as an employee and for the company also. Um, yeah, so it's a really good thing. It's a benefit for you personally, it's a benefit for the company. What about the university? So what, what do they get from it? Yeah, I, I think uh, also the university because um, I do say this in English, um, uh, the university uh, is uh, doing itself re relevant for the corporate life. Um, so my, my industrial PhD is, um, is also doing the humanities uh, uh, at the university, re more relevant for for the the corporate life. That's a very good thing, I think. Right. And and would you have any advice if let's say there's some companies listening now? Uh, I, we want to have a industrial PhD because we want to increase our research experience. So Elizabeth first, and then maybe Pia later. So what would be the general advice if a company now listens and says, "I want a P industrial PhD"? How should they go about? Just find a person who, who has the interest and the background, of course, and, um, and find a problem you want to solve and um, do research around and just get started. And find these persons at the NFR to, to guide you, of course, and start there. And, and I understand in, in your case, Elizabeth, you were, you were the one driving it. And in Sven's case, it was, he was thinking that some other should do the PhD. What about you, Pia? Is, was it you who drove the process? Um, not Well, it was both. I was kind of in the similar uh, group and I wanted to pursue a, a PhD. And so it kind of fit nicely into the start, starting up this company, which was made mainly in the field that I wanted to uh, do research in. So it was kind of 
at the same time where they kind of offered me opportunity to join the company and do uh, an industrial PhD there, which was also a, it was a good uh, opportunity for me to get funding for the project, for a project that I wanted to do. I think it's important to kind of realize that you have to have a project that fits the company also, because it's going to be some time or the, the PhD candidate candidate is going to do have to do some stuff that's not necessarily as relevant for the company all the time. But in the end, it will benefit the com company to have a PhD, uh, industrial PhD student, I think. So we, so we heard that the benefit from the company, we heard that the benefit from the uh, university, but what is there anything the university can do to make it the transition from uh, uh, industrial life into PhD life better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's, uh, well, it is a bit different. I, I see that it's a bit different than uh, other PhD students in the same group because I'm in this uh, host group at Simula. Mm -hmm. They don't have this um, industrial side of everything, which is, I think, a bit different. Um, in many things, like you said, with patents or uh, publications and stuff like that, you have to kind of have that in the back of your head all the time. But I think it's quite, um, it's quite, at least uh, I was lucky that, uh, or our project got approved by the UIO, kind of, because we have this uh, both in the company and, and in the group, it's a, it's a significant academic background also which makes it maybe a bit easier because the, the other people that I've worked with in the company is also from the same research group. So it's not as industrial heavy from, from before. While the more kind of um, industrial people in the company is a bit more uh, kind of towards, do you really need this PhD or can't you just work for the company? <laughs> um, so I think it's good to have this, you have to kind of, you have both sides and you have it, I think that is important and you have to have both sides communicating because the academic people are bound to focus more on that and the industrial people are kind of bound to focus more on that so they will they will try to fight their own cases I think right and let's go to Sven because, before we go to Yunnan because I think you have the exact opposite uh, experience because your company is not that very he academically heavy can you tell us a bit about that experience uh, yes, that's, that's okay. correct. Uh, it's um, not very academic heavy, actually. It's, they focus mostly on the uh, industrial resource and implementation and things like that. And with university, they uh, usually expect different things. But for industrial PhD, I think it's, um, it's best to have both and, and to, to have balance. It's, uh, and uh, in my case, it was very useful that the uh, uh, lab that I work for and eSmart communicated very well. And we uh, make a very unified uh, goal, actually. Everyone understand that uh, that's what we want to achieve both uh, at the university and at eSmart. So it was a good uh, mix there. Yeah. And do you have the same experience, uh, Sven? The the conflict maybe between uh, not so academically heavy company and uh, very academically heavy university. Uh, Is that I, I wouldn't say conflict, but I think uh, depending on the person, there definitely could be some issues. Um, the PhD I'm doing is kind of very driven by my own interest and my own uh, uh, direction. So, so. That is that has good and bad aspects. It's very good that uh, when it's when I'm very interested and I know very clearly where I want to go, that that gives the PhD purpose and direction, and I'm not obliged to do anything that I don't think makes sense, which is good. Uh, but of course, not having anybody really to discuss any of the because I'm the most probably the most technical person in my company, regardless of the, of its, if, if it's computer science or if it's renewable energy or anything. So I don't really have the internal uh, partners for discussion. Um, 
but I think uh, it's it's been okay. I, th I I see there there are some potholes that I probably could have fell into. I, I think that were avoided. Uh, as for the academic side, um, it's been a personal challenge to think uh, more in terms of academia, but um, I think you've been very helpful, uh, especially you must know your ways around the university. It's very, even, I know you're very busy, but even small details, sometimes you just fix them because you know, I don't know who to talk to and then you just get it done, which is extremely helpful. Frees up a lot of uh, mind, uh, mind space. So um, yeah, so that's I see the challenges, but I, I don't think, I think they have been avoided so far. That's nice to hear, of course. But but your boss, for example, does he understand what you're doing? Sven? Uh, from a very shallow perspective, I would say, <laughs> not to uh, not to uh, speak ill of him. He's it's, he's he's um, he comes from the economic side of of uh, running property development. So um, he he's very interested and he he wants to know what we're doing. But I can't speak technical details. It has to be kind of I give him the overview the big picture yeah. yeah and I want to come into another question that came from the audience so for some of you it's obvious for me how you chose your university Elizabeth is in the southern region you chose the southern university Pia is in the Oslo region it's natural to think Oslo you, you're in the Oslo region Sven have a collaboration to with Rema which is a very Trondheim company so how did you choose your university yeah, I mean, you know this story, but I'll tell it so everyone else can hear. I, I actually, the the finishing of our first, let's say, smart warehouse project um, corresponded very nicely with uh, the launch of CARE, the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research at, at UIA. Uh, so I got in touch with uh, Ulrike Stoffar, and then he recommended you as, as a contact. Yeah. Uh, but of course, we, we do our uh, due diligence. So we talk to NTNU and we talk to UIO and uh, they have very skilled people there. But um, even though geographically it didn't make sense, the, the fit for the um, kind of the knowledge base and our application and the type of person we wanted to work with was, uh, was better suited for, for UIA. So it was, yeah. Uh, it was. It just felt like a better fit for for us, at least. Of course, that's nice for us, and it's always nice to have collaboration. Uh, I'll I'll like to ask uh, all of you, finishing up now, uh, the role of Nora startup. So Nora startup is meant as a collaboration between academia and uh, industry, especially startup companies. And if you think. Uh, two years, five years in advance, what would be the greatest uh, opportunity you can think of for Nora Startup? How should Nora Startup support your daily life? So let's start with uh, Elizabeth. What do you think Nora Startup should uh, help you with? Ideally? Well, um, that's a very difficult question, I believe. Um, of course, um, touch base with us, with the company, and, and tell what you're doing. Make yourself relevant. Uh, in, yeah, in, come with information about what you do and yeah. how you see what you how you can support the bank in any way. And that's good. So uh, that probably one of the most important things we can do in my mind is simply explain this is the possibilities you can do <laughs> this is what the startup can get for example uh, when you explain about the possibilities with uh, uh, industrial phd or nairings PhD, which is also possible in the public sector for those that don't know it's uh, two phd possibilities nairings PhD, industrial phd and public sector phd which is basically the same uh, pia what uh, role would nura startup ideally have to support your daily life. Yes, I think, uh, as you said, being uh, kind of giving out the information. I think if we had this when we started, I think we would e more easily have found a lot of the information we have we needed, actually, uh, which I think is important. I think also that you can kind of be put in contact with similar um, similar companies that have done some of the stuff that you're trying to do before would be nice and you think also it's 
a good opportunity for industrial PhDs to talk to each other. So do you talk to many other industrial PhD in your daily life? No, nope, not at all. <laughs> is, so is this the first time you talk to other industrial PhDs? Or? I think I met some at, um, at NFR had this industrial PhD gathering, but uh, they had to kind of, it was supposed to be another one, but it got canceled due to funding and then Corona. So uh, that was the one time I got to actually experienced that there were other industrial PhDs. And now I know three more. <laughs> awesome. So we can make friends here in Nora. That's good. So <laughs> now, what do you think? What could be in Nora startup? Is it uh, you that are a bit more computer science than at least Elisa? But what about things like uh, computational power, that type of resources? Is that something that Nora startup could help you with? Or is that yeah. not at all? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, in my case, I was lucky because eSmart can provide that kind of resource. But uh, for all the uh, industrial PhD students uh, that I know, uh, they have the struggle of finding enough resource, computational power to do their research. And that's an important part of uh, deep learning and machine learning uh, based PhD. You know? If uh, Nura could help with that, that would be very helpful for industrial PhD students and make their life easier. And another thing is about the data as well. Processing data is also a big part of a PhD. That's something I think Nora could help. So. So data, computational power. Do you have anything to add this then? What about intellectual property rights, etc.? Is that something Nora? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was actually what I was thinking. Uh, legal advice, uh, administrative uh, and administrative and practical advice for startup companies would be very useful. Uh, uh, I can see a lot of areas where you could be uh, very beneficial. Um, yeah, I went to um, uh, Grinda School as part of my master thesis. Oh. That model was was very nice and very helpful. We talked to. Uh, uh, I, I was in Texas and we were um, uh, lectured to by successful startup. Uh, individuals where who had been either running multiple startup companies or you know just had one major success their advice was very helpful uh, so you could maybe get in touch with uh, Grinda School and, and those type of environments as well maybe they have some 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 possibilities where you can collaborate so at least Grinde Garagen and other uh, startup uh, initiatives are very close by in uh, Nora startup. So that's a very good, um, uh, very good suggestion. So I think we have to wrap up uh, those questions from the audience, which there have been many of, we didn't manage to answer. We'll try to answer by email. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of the participants. But before I do that, I'll make sure that the, those listen are aware of uh, Nora startup. It's a organization that can that is supposed to enable collaboration between startups uh, in artificial intelligence and academia not only industrial PhDs that we talked about today but other types of collaboration bigger project from the research council in EU or in anything that an AI startup would need and today we've been so lucky that we've had uh, uh, four very talented industrial PhDs. We have had Elisabeth Asser from Sparbank in Sør, together with the University of Agder, Pia Smetsel from Ogar Medical in collaboration with uh, Simula, Nan van Nygien from eSmart Systems in collaboration with the University of Tromsø, and Sven Opalik from Login Eindom and Rema Tusen in collaboration with the University of Agder. So the next webinar will be in two weeks. It will probably be the last webinar before uh, the Christmas and the end of New Year. And I don't want to spoil anything, but we have potentially great uh, webinar, but everything is not settled yet. So we should just keep our, be a little bit secretive. But in two weeks, it will be a great webinar if everything goes right. So I wish all of you a nice weekend. Thank you.